All right, we're live. Welcome to another episode of Raven Fit Talks. Thanks for joining me again today, guys. My name is DJ White. I will be the host of this Raven Fit Talks. I am the owner and founder of Raven Fit, which is a men's coaching platform where I teach men professionally how to train your bodies, how to transform your minds, and essentially rediscover your own masculinity, which for a lot of us leaves at some point in our life. And that might be society's problem, but at the end of the day, it's always a you problem. And I hope you guys fix that. So today, what we're going to be doing is going over a mindset talk. Now, this book, The Book of Five Rings, is one of my absolute favorite books in the world when it comes to masculine mindset. I would argue you won't find a better book on masculine mindset than the book you have here. This man is a man who not only wrote about how to be the greatest swordsman in the world, he was. He was. Back in the 1600s, this is the legendary sword saint of Japan, Miyamoto Musashi. And this man had over 60 duels on paper and lived to tell about it. And if you guys know anything about duels back in the day, if you had a duel, it was to the death. So if you walked away, that means you killed the other guy. He had 60, got to the end of his life and wrote a book about it. That means this man is undefeated. Now, just think about that. This isn't undefeated in boxing matches with gloves. This isn't undefeated in a basketball record where you have teams and people to rely on. No, 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 no. This is a man who was undefeated relying on himself. So we're talking about a guy who not only did everything he's going to say in this book, but he's going to tell you how to do it. This is like hearing absolute instructions from Kobe Bryant straight from his mouth, instructions from Tom Brady straight from his mouth. We're talking about a guy who was an absolute savage back in his day. He literally wrecked everyone he ever fought. The legendary source in Japan. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through his book. I'm not going to hit every single point because the book, you know, can get a bit wordy. I'm going to touch on the subjects that I found to be the most relevant to me growing up, which had a lot to do with how I transformed myself into becoming a man. I wasn't always this guy who's, you know, slightly handsome sitting here with tattoos and looking like a polished look. When I was growing up in high school, guys, I was the most shy person in the world. We're talking about a dude who was I, I would be shake. I would convulse if I had to talk to a girl. I was super shy. I never talked to anybody. All I wanted to do was draw all day long. You know, I still had dreams of working for Disney as a sketch artist. I would sit there and watch cartoons. I wasn't in great shape. I had no confidence whatsoever. And if there are any books out there that completely reshape my mindset, this right here is top three. Absolute top three. I mean, I put this up there with how to win friends and influence people. I mean, if you're a man who wants to learn exactly what, it like, what it's like to be reliant on yourself to get things done and to prove to yourself that you can do it and to understand what's expected from you as a man in any time period, okay? This is a guy who lived in the 1500s and 1600s, and his words are still even more relevant today. Hasn't changed. That's why this book is so integral. And it had a lot to do with transforming my own mindset. So I'm happy to share this journey with you guys. So let's get things going. So this book, Book of Five Rings, he calls it Five Rings because it has five chapters. You've got the chapter of earth, chapter of water, chapter of fire. You've got wind and you have the book of emptiness as well as the legendary Dokolo, which we'll do on another day. So I'm going to make this episode one of a six part series following the book written by Miyamoto Musashi. So let's kick things off. Chapter one, we've got the Earth chapter. All right. And mind you guys, the artwork here, just like you saw a second ago, is done by the legendary manga artist Takihiko Inoue, who did famous works like Vagabond. And that's where all these um, scenes come from, as well as like Slam Dunk. I mean, this guy is an absolute amazing, amazing artist. The first picture you guys saw was hand painted. This one is also hand painted. So I want you guys to enjoy the artwork as I tell this story. But let's dive right in. So everything you guys see here, these are all going to be quotations from him. None of this stuff is actually my words. I'll give my account of it. But anything you guys see here, there's no quotations. It doesn't matter. It's all his words. Here he goes. He kicks it off. He says, I have named my own way of the martial arts, the Niten Ichiryu or two heavens, one style. For those guys who don't know what Niten means, Ni meaning two, Ten meaning swords. This is the man. I'm sorry, Ten meaning heavens. This is a man who decided to hold one sword in each hand during a time period when for hundreds of years of being a samurai, everybody held both hands on their katana, their main long sword. This man came around and said, nope, you guys are all stupid. I'm going to hold one sword in each hand. I'm going to defeat all you guys because I'm smarter. And guess what? He actually did. This guy lived it. This is not a, a fake recount of a guy who thought about doing it. This is the man. This is the Michael Jordan of Michael Jordans. Put it that way. 
He says he was born in the province of Harima. I am the warrior Shinmen Musashi no Kami Fujiwara no Genshin. Uh, so he goes by multiple names. He, I think he was originally, man, I forget his first name. Saw with a B actually way back in the day uh, when he was younger. And then he changed it from that to Takizo. When he entered the uh, famous war of Sekigahara back in the 1600s, he uh, decided to join and fight for the Shinmen clan. So that's where he took the last name of Shinmen and went by Shinmen Takizo. And then when he went out on his own, after they unfortunately lost, he was on the losing side. He decided to take the name of Musashi and then his last name, Miyamoto, from Miyamoto Village, which was his original village. So if you guys see the word Shinmen Musashi, that's just another um, thing that he would sign himself on. I think it might be more like a sense of pride. Um, he did fight really hard for the side, even though he lost, but it stays with him. He says, I have now reached the age of 60. From long ago in my youth, I set my mind on the martial arts. And I had my first match at the age of 13. And guys, first match meaning match to the death. Nothing he's going to talk about here. These aren't sparring scenarios. Back then, people were fighting to the death. And so right here, you have Takehiko Inoue wonderfully illustrating his very first uh, very first combat situation, his very first fight against a uh, master of the Shinto style who actually wandered into his village as a child. His name was Aroma Kihei, whom I defeated. Now, I want you guys to think about this. He just said, I had my first match when I was 13. This is a 13-year-old boy who killed a grown man. And how did he kill him? He killed him with a blunt instrument. He killed him by whacking him either with, and there's multiple recounts of it. People will say the very sign that was signed during the time as a challenge to the uh, Aroma Kihie, that sign he beat him over the head with, which is what Takihiko illustrated. Some people say he brought his own wooden staff or wooden sword and hit him either way he did strike the guy caught him off guard rammed into him got him down on the ground and he finished him there um, people say it's either a blow to the head with a wooden instrument or some people say he pulled out the other guy's sword and stabbed him either way he killed a grown ass man at the age of 13. that just shows you what kind of savage this guy was then he goes on to say at the age of 16 i defeated a strong martial artist by the name of tajima no Akiyama. and right here you see once again using a wooden bludgeon that's going to be a common theme for musashi i believe most of his battles he just he wins by blunt force trauma he's whacking people over the head with a wooden instrument whether it be a boken a practice sword or some sort of like elongated form of a wooden staff anytime he carries something with two hands that's what it's going to be otherwise if he's doing one sword in each hand he has the knee 10 each real style but that's going to be a common theme about the stuff he does guys he says at the age of 20, I went to the capital and I met with famous martial artists. And although I fought a number of matches, I was never unable to take the victory. Ooh, some savage words. After that, I went from province to province, from place to place, and encountered martial artists from many different schools. And though I fought as many as 60 matches, I did not lose even once. Guys, he could easily just say, oh, I never lost a fight. No, no, no. This is a man who was like, no matter what you guys threw at me, I was never unable to take your victory. I was never the guy who lost. I did not lose even once. That's savage. Okay. And mind you guys, once again, these are all fights to the death. This guy's a legend. So what I did was I compiled some of his most famous defeats or victories, I could just say, and the people he defeated. So he has multiple very, very famous fights. During the time, there was a very famous clan called the Yoshioka clan, and he was able to destroy all three of the uh, Kenpos, who are the guys who were the head of it. First, he killed the older brother, Seijiro. He ended up striking him on his right side and destroying his, his shoulder, and the guy was unable to continue battle. Okay, so he essentially maimed him. The second battle he had was against his younger brother and the younger brother wanted to you know at this time back then guys if you ever lost to a guy like musashi now keep this in mind musashi was essentially a wandering samurai he was a ronin he was not in service and what he did was he went to the top schools all around japan and said you know what you guys think you know what you're talking about bring out your best guy i'm gonna kill him i'm gonna take care of him and people think to themselves like who is this country bumpkin this dude is you know He's 
doesn't follow ceremony. He looks disheveled. This dude's an idiot. And so he went to the Yoshioka clan over in Kyoto during the time. And he went there and he challenged the most famous school in that area. Seijiro, who was the eldest, said, I'll take the battle. Bring this guy on. They set a date for the battle. When the battle is about to commence, Seijiro shows up. He's wearing full ritualistic. He's got the best garbs. Let's do his best dress. Probably a pretty boy, right? Everyone loved him. He's the, the head Kenpo. He's the head um, instructor of the school. This man had super swag. This was the guy who was, you know, the, the guy to be. He was the all-star. He was like the he was like the Brad Pitt of that area. And he shows up to the match. And Musashi shows up late. Now, if you guys know anything about Japanese culture, showing up late is an absolute no-no, right? You guys have speed trains that exist nowadays where they are right by the second they're on time. Same thing back then. Japan, very, very big on rituals, formalities, and tradition. Musashi was like, nah, I'll show up when I feel like it. So in doing that, by the time Musashi did show up, whether it actually was his tactic or not, we're not really sure. Seijiro was pissed. He was angry. And that anger was enough to warp his mindset into thinking, I just got to kill this guy now. So I'm sure he was a little bit crazier with his swipes. You know, he was swinging his sword wider than he should have. He was not tied in his formations. And sure enough, Musashi was able to take the victory. Bam. Struck him super hard on his left shoulder. Dude basically busted his arm. Seijiro was unable to continue. The fight was over. Now, as soon as that was done, people were like, hey, we can't let this country bumpkin come in and just defeat our school. It doesn't work that way. So think of like all your favorite uh, animes where guys get, you know, super pissed off. Like, oh, we can't let this guy come in. We got to fight for the honor. That's exactly what freaking happened. So right away, then Shichiro, the younger brother, said, I'll fight you then. And then Shichiro was considered a very, very strong man as well. He was a much taller man, um, a guy that used a lot of power. And you guys will notice that here. He's actually taller than Musashi, even though Musashi's crouching down. He's definitely much taller. And he's like, you know what? Fine. We'll set up another match. I'm going to defeat him. And the school was in a rush to get Musashi killed because, like, we can't let anybody come in here and destroy our honor. So Musashi decides, hey, showing up late to the first one, that seemed to work. I'll show up when I feel like it again. Sure enough, he came super late. Then Chichido was absolutely pissed. Musashi was able to unnerve him, check his blows, and take the victory. And that's what you guys see here. You see Musashi taking a swipe straight through Den Chichido, and he finishes him. So now we got two of the guys killed at the school. And there's only one guy left. And the last guy is Mata, uh, ooh, Mata Shichiro Yoshioga, which is actually uh, Den Shichiro's son, I believe it was. And now he, that's it. But he's a 13-year-old boy, right? Musashi went in there and wiped out the two heads of the school. They're an absolute dishonor. And then all of a sudden, Matashishida was like, you know what? I'll duel you. But was he being a fair man? No, 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 no. Because honor was that state, guys. So Matashishida wasn't like, hey, I'll do a 1v1. I'm only 13 years old. I'll take this guy. He said, hell no. Nah. We're going to jump him. So at the very, very famous Ichijoti Temple, Matashishida was there waiting for uh, Musashi, give him a formal duel declaration. But he was accompanied by, and multiple accounts will say different things, anywhere between, I'd say, about 60 to 100 guys. Real talk, guys. Basically, all the students of the Yoshioka, uh, the Yoshioka clan came there that day to jump Musashi. They were like, you know what? We're not having this. I think the most common and most accurate one that people argue is that there's 60 students. So think about it. 60 guys against one man. It was at this moment that Musashi figured out, hey, I should probably hold one sword in each hand. So this is the legendary time he developed the Niten Ichiryu. He decided to take his katana out with his right hand and his wakazashi out with his left. And parrying guys, slashing, parrying, slashing, he was able to get through the entire collection of guys. He didn't kill them all, but he was able to get enough of them done. I believe he, some accounts said that he killed about 13 guys that day, which is crazy. Imagine being one guy in a battlefield at the lowest number of 60 dudes. And you're just wasting them back and forth, wasting them back and forth. He got all the way to Matashiro. Matsushiro, and then kills him, I guess, in one stroke. Dude is done. Dead. And as soon as that happens, he turns tail and he sprints on out of there. So you can imagine, Yoshioka school is in absolute dishonor. They're done. It's over, guys. We're talking about an illustrious school, the entire thing taken apart, probably within a matter of weeks, if that. Everything destroyed by this one man who comes in and wrecks everybody. So that already made him a legend. A legend. This is a guy who didn't just fight 1v1. He killed everybody. And he was able to fight multiple people who were trying to take his head with actual real swords and instruments. So the stuff you're going to hear from this guy 
he's he's a different breed. He, he's he's a breed that no one else has ever been able to emulate, and then we'll never see something like that ever again. I guarantee it. Then from there, he travels over to Nara, I believe, and he uh, battles against the uh, very, very famous Inshun of the Hosuin Temple, which is a master of the spear, a.k.a. Lance. Oftentimes, you guys will see it depicted here with the three prongs. Um, he was able to bring it to a stalemate, which was amazing because uh, that was considered a tool and Inshun was considered a genius at the time. He was able to beat him and defeat him in a duel. Then he goes over and battles the very legendary Shishido Baiken. Shishido Baiken was the master of the chain and sickle. And guys, just think about that. We could watch fun little animes and stuff like that where guys are like, oh, I got this one sickle. I got this chain. I'm going to swing it around. I'm going to throw it at you. This guy actually used it. Okay. And this wasn't for fun. Imagine. Imagine you guys had a table of any weapon that you guys can select. You got swords over here. You got some size, nunchucks. You got a bow staff. You got spears. You got a chain sickle. Which one are you picking to defend yourself with? You're going to be throwing some stupid little heavy-weighted thing on a, on, a, on a chain and chuck it at people and hope to kill them? No, because you think that sounds ridiculous. Like, how am I supposed to even hit that guy? Well, Shishido Baikin mastered that. So in real life, this guy was wasting people with a chain and freaking sickle. And what you guys see here in the picture is you see Musashi's sword entangled with the actual chain, Shishido Baikin pulling on it with a sickle in Shishido Baikin's left hand. And long story short, and we'll talk about it more on another day. Musashi was able to strike him down and kill him. And he did that by actually throwing one of his swords directly at Shishido and striking him right in the chest. So his Wakazashi went through his chest and he sprang up to him to finish the blow. So that was tremendous back then. And guys, I mean, imagine being alive during that time and seeing what a real master was like. This wouldn't even be like cool Hollywood stuff. Like, how can I make it look cool moves? No. Imagine what that guy must have been doing enough to say, you know what? I have enough confidence in this little ball and chain that I can actually fight, and I've been killing samurai for decades. Well, Musashi went in there, and he just stopped his reign. But legendary battle, I can imagine. And then, of course, he has the battle against the the was the demon of the Western provinces, the great Ganryu Sasaki Kojiro, uh, who wielded a nodachi, which was a longsword. Now, guys, if you understand what the longsword is, it sounds really cool in myths and fables. You guys can watch your favorite anime and say, oh, you know, the longsword, what a cool sword. He can swipe people down. So the Nodachi was originally created to be able to strike not just the man, but to strike the man and horse when a man is mounted on a horse. Right? That's crazy. So this is a long instrument, too long to be usually used in one on one combat. Like, why would you? Right? It's really long. I'm sure it's a lot heavier. I'm sure to weight a lot more than a katana. It makes you less nimble. But this man was murking people all the way to the point where he was known as the demon of the Western provinces. So just like Musashi, he was wasting everyone. And then toward the tail end of Musashi's life, um, I'm sorry, his own fighting career, which was, I, I think, 29, 28-ish, he went against the legendary Ganryu uh, Sasaki Koshiro, and he killed him. And we'll talk more about Ganryu in the future and his, his very famous swallow cut, which is a way that he was able to just mark everybody during that time. Um, but him defeating him cemented him as essentially the greatest of all time at that point. It was already, it was already a wrap. This guy was a legend. So he says... All of these events occurred from the time I was 13 to 29. When I passed the age of 30 and I thought back over my life, I understood that I had not been a victor because of extraordinary skill in the martial arts. Perhaps I had some natural talent or had not departed from natural principles. Or again, was it that the martial arts of the other styles were lacking somewhere? Now, guys, this is beautiful. So instead of him taking credit and saying, you know what? I'm just a genius. I'm better than everybody. He's like, no, no, no. that's not the case. Maybe I'm actually not a genius. Maybe I didn't do anything extraordinary. Maybe I'm just fighting the normal way and everyone else is lost. That's crazy. That's crazy. Imagine Michael Jordan says, I'm not the best basketball player. I'm the only one playing actual basketball. Everyone else is just floundering around doing a bunch of nonsense. You'd be like, what? That's crazy. That's what he says. He's like, maybe everyone else was just slacking. I'm not a genius. They just don't see what I see. They're effectively kind of stupid. Maybe that's the case which is a bold claim. He said, after that, determined all the more to reach a clear understanding of the deep principles I practiced day and night. By about the time I was 50, I realized the way of the martial arts quite naturally. Think about that, guys. He stopped all his really amazing feats by about the age of 30. Then he says, to understand my craft more, I'm going to practice day and night, 
Fast forward 20 more years. Uh, by the time I was 50, now I realize I understood what martial arts meant. You're like, what? So, guys, this is a guy who wasn't just someone who did turn things on and off. This guy was about that life. All he did was train. This is a man who was ready at all times. You got to think about it. For a man like him to walk around the world, have 60 duels on paper and defeat everybody, you don't think there were guys who were unscrupulous who wanted to jump him when he wasn't paying attention? Who would, you know, when he's laying his head down to rest, who might not try to ambush him? You think this guy ever got a chance to relax? Like, think about it. If anybody you guys have seen, um, what is it? Uh, Afro Samurai. That's a really cool depiction because in Afro Samurai, what happens? When you're number two, everyone wants your headband because you can't fight number one until you beat number two. So essentially, if you're number two, you're the top of everyone who has privilege. And so you don't get a chance to rest. So this man never had a chance to relax, never had a chance to have family, this or that, because everyone wanted his head. Because if you took his head, then you can get instant recognition. You can build a resume for yourself. And that's what guys did back in the day. You know, like being a warrior was just one of the occupations you had. But if you had skill or not, what matters, what was your resume? Because every guy who was mastering the sword wanted to get employed at some point, right? You're learning how to do the sword because it's an actual occupation. So you're thinking to yourself, I want to get hired by a shogun, a daimyo. I want someone to bring me into service and pay me and give me land. Well, you got to prove your skills. You got to build a resume. You build a resume by taking people's heads. So imagine the resume you would build off of taking Musashi's head. You think he had a chance to relax, spend time with family? Think he had weekends off? Never. So we're talking about a man who was in it at all given times. It's a level of dedication that we actually can't equate to anyone around here. No one lives life that kind of way. And he says, entrusting myself to the principles of a martial art, I have never had a teacher while studying the ways of the various arts and accomplishments or in anything at all. Now, this one's a little interesting on the translation here because there are actual recounts that he did learn from his father, Munasai Shinman. Uh, yeah, Munasai. Uh, I forget his first name. Uh, but Munasai, he did learn from him. Um, his father was a master of the Jite, which is like, um, you know, Raphael has those size. Well, imagine a side that only has one prong on one side. So it's like a small metal uh, uh, instrument or tool that's kind of sharp at the end, like a pinpoint. And it has just the one angle coming out inside. So his father was a master of the Jite. So he definitely taught Musashi when he was a kid how to handle that, how to understand awareness, because otherwise, how would he know how to beat someone at the age of 13? Right. So he definitely had some masters in some way. We know that he was also schooled by Takuan Soho, which is the very famous um, Buddhist monk who taught Yagyu Mununori. He also wrote the book on Fettered Mind. And we will go over that one day, too, because that is uh, also in my top three pantheon of greatest books of all time that I've written or that I've, uh, I've read. So I wouldn't say he didn't have any teaching at all. But in terms of how to fight once he left his village. So from the point of like 16 all the way to the point of 30, for sure, he didn't have any masters. And I think that's what he's alluding to here. So if you guys all fact check them, that, that's essentially the explanation here. And so this is him moving through his lifestyle. Once again, beautiful art from Takahiko, same as a young lad. Him essentially when he's about 16 to 18. This is him in his 20s. And then, of course, in old age. OK, now on to the topic of the way of the martial arts. What is called the martial arts is the standard of the military clans yet. There are no warriors who clearly understand the way of the martial arts in the world today. Ooh, what does he mean by that? The term warrior speaks of the two ways of culture and conflict. A warrior should make his best effort in the martial arts according to his own abilities and situation, even if he is naturally untalented in this way. So what he's saying here is, on the first part, there are no warriors around. No one's about that life is what he said back in the 1600s, which is crazy, right? Because people were still fighting to the death. Even then, he was like, you guys are about that life. Then he goes on to say that a warrior should make his best efforts in the martial arts to the according to his own abilities. As in, if you're not super strong, use the gifts that you have. Maybe you have good speed. You have a good insight perspective. It doesn't matter what you have. He doesn't really care. Use whatever abilities that you have on your own, even if you're naturally untalented. It doesn't really matter. But you should master your way of expression, which is where Bruce Lee got a lot of his, his, uh, his philosophy from. He says, what is most basic in the way of practicing the martial arts is overcoming your opponent in each and any event, whether in victory or a single opponent in a duel or in victory in a fight with a number of men. The true way of the martial arts is to train so that these skills are useful at any time 
and to teach these skills so that they will be useful in all things. Now, this is amazing, guys. So what he's saying is when you guys devote yourselves to the martial arts, you're not doing it just to learn how to swing a sword or just learn how to punch somebody if you're doing boxing. There is a way to understand martial arts in every single thing that you do. Every facet of your life, you can integrate martial arts into it and you can become a better person. And that's going to be a huge philosophy principle for him moving forward. These days, the men are making their way through the world, calling themselves martial artists, are generally only teachers of sword techniques. Ooh, look at that. Talking trash. Once again, he says, these days, the men making their way through the world, calling themselves martial artists, are generally only teachers of sword techniques. Not have any spirit. When you look at the world, the various arts have been tailored to be items for sale. Ooh, he's calling them ornaments. Likewise, a person thinks of himself as something to be sold, and even the implements of these ways are proffered as merchandise. So what he's saying, guys, is people have lost the way. In the 1600s, people no longer are actually fighting. He's basically saying greater people came before us. But nowadays, when you go to dojos, they're teaching you how to make your technique look pretty. He's just saying that people are just teaching you and they want to charge you to learn their style. And now martial arts has just become an item for sale, which we see all the time. You know, Bruce Lee would call it dry land swimming, which he saw frequently when he was uh, training himself. And he noticed that. Musashi goes on to say, this mentality divides the flower and the fruit into two and makes much less of the fruit than the flower. That's right. So in other words, there's a lot of floaty, a lot of pretty stuff, but no real substance. No real intention there, no resolve, and people have become weak. So if any of you guys are out there saying, you know what, oh, these kids nowadays are lost and we knew stuff in our generation. No, you didn't, because every generation says people have been lost. He said guys lost the way of fighting back in the 1600s when people are still fighting to death. So if he said it back then, this is just a cultural problem. This is always the case. By this, form is made into ornament. The flower is forced into bloom and technique is made into display. One talks of this or that dojo, teaching this way or that way in an attempt to gain some benefit. In other words, saying use these hand skills, use this footwork so you can pay me money and learn my style. It is said that the immature martial art is a source of great injury. And this is certainly the truth, especially back then. If you learn the wrong martial art, you're actually going to die. Imagine, you know, going to a school where someone's like, here's how you should fight. You pay for instruction. Now you think you're a badass. You get into a real duel. Dude just cuts you down. You're like, wait, oh, what? I, I didn't know what I was doing. How did this happen? Once again, immature martial arts is the source of great injury. So people were lost back then. They really were. So he's going to go into the four occupations. Now, this is a very, very important piece of Japanese culture altogether. They equate everything to work. And what Musashi has done here is he said, okay, well, let's look at the four occupations that someone can have in society. And I want to be able to relate that to what it means to be a warrior. Okay, so this is awesome here. He's going to break things down for you based on, you know, Japanese culture. So generally speaking, people make their way through the world in four ways. The way of the farmer, the merchant, the warrior, and the carpenter. So he says the farmer prepares various farming implements with regard to the changing seasons and lives out his continuum all his life. The merchant makes sake and various forms of his production, makes a profit from good or poor quality and earns a living this way. He says the warrior hones his weapons of the various military practices and must determine the proper use of those weapons without the preparations of weapons and an understanding of the advantages of each one. Wouldn't the accomplishments of the warrior clans lose a bit of their depth? And the carpenter, he says, skillfully prepares all the different kinds of tools, learns the best way of using each one, takes out his carpenter square, works correctly according to the plans, does not work unfailingly, and makes his way through the world. The warrior and the carpenter are very similar and should be compared. OK, so here you go. Here's his way of saying, I'll just take an example. Let's say the carpenter. So he says the carpenter knows all the measurements of various buildings, temples, pagodas, monasteries, towers, castles and houses. He manages people and their duties and responsibilities, just like a warrior clan general would. He says in the way of carpentry, selection of wood is a foundational problem. Well, wood that's straight without knots and good in appearance will be used as front pillars. Slightly knotted wood that's straight and strong will be used in the rear. Wood that may be weak, but has no knots will be used for door sills and doors and wood full of knots and warped, but strong will be used for structural support, right? So in other words, everything has a place guys, no matter how inconsequential or useless, it has a place. 
I'm going to tell you right now, think about that in your own life. Think about that when it comes to your own skills you have to offer the world. You might say, I'm not as tall as this guy, not as handsome as this guy. It doesn't matter. You have gifts that are given to you. It's your responsibility to figure out how to use them. Okay. And that's what I suggest here. And then he says, wood full of knots, warped and weak will be used for scaffolding and kindling. When managing carpenters, the master carpenter should assess their skills and put them to work accordingly. The most skills will conduct the foundation and alcoves, right? Do the most important work. The moderately skilled. Hold on. Give me a second, guys. Ah, there we go. Sorry about that. Lighting got a little messed up here. Getting, uh, getting nightfall now. Uh, so he says the moderately skilled men will build the doors and lentils and ceiling. Unskilled men will fix door joints and planes and wedges. He said master instructors will shape pillars and beams, ascertain correct measurements, and perform his duties down to the smallest detail. In doing so, he will become a master carpenter himself. His aim should be to carry equipment that will cut well and do and to sharpen that equipment. He's an expert in wielding that equipment to shape structures in whichever way he pleases. A man who is a soldier is like this. Okay, so let's just rewind that. Let's look at how it would be if you were a swordsman. You are understanding how to instruct which soldiers should be doing what kind of work. So imagine you're a general and you have an army. Okay, well, just like I'm going to go ahead and assign which kind of wood is going to be good for building this house. Even the weak pieces of wood all have a purpose. Same thing. Every single man who owns your army, they all have a purpose. Every single tool you have on your tool belt has a purpose. Maybe not the fastest guy, but there's something that you can do to win. And so anytime you think to yourself like, man, you know, I, I just can't go through life, man. I'm, I'm not I'm not as smart as everybody or you know, how come everybody else on social media has cloud or these people have money. Yeah, but what tools do you have? There's something that you have asymmetrical access to, which is truly what the American dream is about. The reason why capitalism works so well is because it gives people asymmetrical access to the market, which means you can bring something very, very unique and distinct that no one else can. Now, it's your responsibility to identify that and then make it amazing. And that's what Musashi is saying. A carpenter has to do the same thing with his people, with his types of wood he has. He can't choose what workers he has. He said, okay, well, if you're not really skilled, guess what, homie? You get to make the doors and lentils. You can make the door frames. Oh, you're really skilled? Cool. You're going to work on foundation. Oh, you're moderately skilled? Okay. You can kind of work on the beams and Maybe you can outfit the alcoves and make some nice designs around the house, but he's going to put everything to work. The idea is that you're putting every tool at your disposal to work. And one common thing for Musashi, reason why he was so amazing with what he decided to do when it came to swordsmanship is because he believed that no man should die with the weapon unsheathed at his side, which makes total sense. You don't want to die with weapons still in your pockets. Like imagine you, you get off by some dude and your gun is still in the holster. It doesn't make any sense. If you're going to die, Die with all your weapons at the ready. Do everything you possibly can. That's the same mentality when it comes to you giving 100% into whatever you want to do. You shouldn't go into anything half-assed. You should be giving your absolute best at all times. And that's what he's saying here. Okay, so he, re he relates both of them together. So now we're going to go ahead and dive into his, his classic and revolutionary Niten Ichi Ryu style. And this is a beautiful photo of him. Ooh, beautiful photo of him done by, obviously, Takahiko of him wielding both swords. All right, he says, warriors wear two swords at their waists, the katana, the wakizashi, or tachi. When you put your life on the line, you want all of your weapons to be of use. No man should die with his weapons still on his waist. Right? I just said it a second ago. Holding a seeker weapon with both hands limits freedom of movement and should only be done when one hand won't get the job done. I'll say that again. Holding a single weapon with both hands limits your freedom of movement. And you should only, and this should only be done when one hand won't get the job done. So if you can't kill the dude with one hand, then maybe you can do the double grip and get extra power. But other than that, one each hand. Battles should not be a time consuming event. Guys, think about it. You're fighting to the death. You don't have time to say, cool, let's go several rounds. I got to work on my endurance and stamina. I throw a check. He checks me back. I go back and forth. No, no, no. You don't have that luxury. You just got to go straight forward. You got to say, you know what? This is where I want to be. I'm going to take this fight. I need to finish this guy ASAP for multiple reasons. For one, the more strikes he takes at you, the greater chance he has of actually harming you. You don't want that to happen. There weren't any instant medics. You can't you know, take a sensu bean and instantly heal yourself for the next opponent. You also don't know who's waiting. 
he could be surrounded by homies who want to jump you because you killed their guy. And they're like, you know what? We're not letting you out of here. You destroyed our honor, which was a huge deal back then. So his mentality was your way of killing somebody should be fast and swift. You don't want to leave any room for someone to harm you. you got to make sure the other people around you might also want to jump you. you got to get out of there quick. And so you need stamina for all those things. So your battle should not be time consuming ever. And it's better to go through life thinking I'm going to kill him quickly than not to. And later on, we go to the Book of Fire. We'll talk about how he often, I'm sorry, talk about how he often, he often says you should never let your opponent make a second strike. It's big. Let's talk about that later. All right. He says uh, to learn how to wield a sword in one hand. Oh, hello. Hold on. Don't lose me here. All right. To learn how to wield a sword in one hand, first take up two swords. Ta-da. Right. Instead of saying, hey, how do I figure this thing out? Well, if you have one in each hand, you have no choice. OK, trial by fire. It will be difficult in the beginning, as are all things, but you will improve and it will become normal. Now, the way of the sword is not in handling it with speed. OK, you don't be fast. You need to be quick. Do not be, you know, don't slash at someone. You need to cut through them. There needs to be resolved. So don't worry about being the guy who's like able to dodge and be. No, what matters is, are you effective? Are you moving the right way? So do not be a man who's obsessed with speed. It does not matter. The katana is best in open spaces and the wakizashi in narrow spaces. Once again, the katana is a longer sword. That's going to be best in wider open areas. If you're in more narrow spaces, use the wakizashi. Okay. This is the most fundamental way. Now he says in this style, you will win with either the long or short sword, which means you will not be limited by the length of the sword like your opponents are. Guys, guys, that's major. Okay. What he realized during that time is if everyone has the sword with two hands, there's only so far that you can extend it and you're limited to it. OK, but if he has one sword each hand, he doesn't have to be restricted here where your shoulders are squared out. He can extend this way. He can move his body. He can go left, right. He can duck. He can go back and forth. He can use two as opposed to being restricted to this. See how much more boxy this looks as opposed to I can be fluid with my hand movements and move around. I can cut. I can slash. I can parry and I can hit. It was a very, very fluid style that somehow no one ever thought of because everyone wanted to do whatever worked in the past. Everyone was too scared to go out and figure out something else. Well, this man did. And he said, hey, these guys are limited. If you have both hands on the swords, I know there's only so far you can go and I'll defeat you. The way of this style is the mind that obtains the victory with anything at all. So he says, hold both swords, whether fighting in the open, in narrow spaces, against one man or 10,000 men. This is the way it is by the virtue of the sword that both society and oneself are put in order Ooh. guys this is that statement again it is by the virtue of the sword that both society and oneself are put in order you know there's a there's a quote i forget who said it might have been like nietzsche back in the day he said a man who cannot obey himself will be commanded by others. This is the way of nature. We all know that the most masculine men are the ones who command themselves and make rules for themselves to follow. But the men who don't follow any rules, they're untamed, they're the weak guys. They got that nobody in society, they don't, no one respects those guys. No one cares about what they do. They're never going to reach a level of glory and honor of a man who says, you know what? I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't yell at my wife. I don't do this to friends. I always hold my promises. I wake up at 6 a.m. When you make rules for yourself, the world respects you. You don't have rules. Ah, uh, I yell when I want to. Oh, I got plastered last night. I was so drunk. I didn't even want to go out. It's kind of what my friends told me to go out. That's all weak mindset. And a lot of us get wrapped up in that. We start thinking to ourselves, well, it's all good. Hakuna Matata, you know, YOLO, you only live once. You're also a weak man. And Musashi was anything but weak. And he says, living by virtue of the sword, when you devote yourself to a way and a path of living your life you yourself are going to put your own life in order and as a result you put society in order that's big that's big you know i think it might have been jocko willink and uh jordan peterson had a conversation years ago and they came up with this very very good phrase and i actually uh, cited in a lot of my reels that i do that discipline equals freedom and not just that but responsibility is freedom because in order to have freedom, it's your responsibility to uphold the freedoms of everyone else. So in actuality, the more freedom you have, the more responsibility you take to make sure those freedoms are fought for. 
that's a big deal. So when you yourself believe in a higher ideal, you're going to organize the world to believe in it. But if you don't believe in anything, the world becomes chaos and you become lost. And there's a lot of guys out there, and even guys who might be listening to this right now, you guys are lost. You guys don't understand the importance of organizing yourself and making rules for yourself. And that's what I teach my guys every single day. You must have rules to run your lives by. And the best way to get that going is work on your fitness first. After your fitness, that's going to have to change your mindset. Then you also read books. You get yourself smarter. You listen to things that are going to make you smarter and a stronger man. But it's all done by creating order. None of it's chaos. None of it's willy nilly. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't party. Have I done it in the past? Yes. Was I wasting time? Absolutely. Did it help me with my goals? No. And so I stopped doing it years ago. I haven't had a drink maybe at least in a few years. Why? Because I make rules for myself to get up at 3.15 every single day, get myself going, be there for my clients, be there for my wife, be there for my friends, be there for my business. I have things I'm trying to do. So guess what? I organize my life and no one has to tell me what to do. My wife ever has to come in and say, hey, babe, it's three o'clock. You got to wake up. I'm already awake. You don't have to wake me up. If anything, I'll wake her up. I make rules for myself so that I don't need to be commanded. That's how you stay strong. Okay. Keep that in mind. Heidi says, uh, if one man can defeat 10 men, then 100 men can defeat 1,000. And 1,000 can defeat 10,000. In my way, one man or 10,000 men are the same. All right, the rhythm of the martial arts. There is a rhythm to everything, especially the martial arts. There's a rhythm of musicians playing wind and string instruments, a bowman, Timing the release of the bow, the fire of the rifle, mounting a horse, positioning oneself on the battlefield, rising to service of your Lord, retreating in battle, and being in harmony with others. Rhythm is formless and specific in each and every way. You should discriminate thoroughly between all rhythms. So what is he saying here? You should be able to see martial arts in every single thing that you do. But don't for a second think that everything has the same rhythm. Let's look in when it comes to fighting. Not every person has the same length of bones, same quickness, agility, power, strength, speed, coordination, flexibility, whatever you want to call it. For that reason, every fight has its own rhythm. You guys may have heard before people say styles make fights. Why? Because they're different rhythms. And you got to understand when you fight one person or another, the rhythm is different. Just as much as if you go from playing a wind instrument to a string instrument to releasing the timing of bow to hopping on a horse to retreating from battle, it all has its own rhythms. Understand that rhythm itself is formless, just like you should be. At the same time, it can be very, very specific. And if you think of rhythm as being formless, you, your mind never gets encapsulated. You become narrow-minded into thinking, no matter what, I'm always going to vote Republican because I'll never go see the side of the aisle or vice versa. Or, you know, I'll, I'll never listen to what anything my dad said because I don't like him. I guarantee there's nuggets of truth there. And if you close your mind off, you're just going to become a weaker man. you got to understand that everything has a rhythm. There is usefulness in all things. If you can discern and discriminate between all these rhythms, you will then see the truth. You'll see the true way. And that's a very, very important concept. Okay, lastly, rules for practicing the way. He breaks things down for you guys. He says, for those who study my martial art, there are rules for putting it into practice. Number one, think without dishonesty. So what is he saying there? You can't always tell the truth, but you don't ever have to lie. And for damn sure, you shouldn't be lying to yourself. Understand reality for what it is. See things for what they are. Learn to be objective. Stop being so freaking emotional and learn how to see life for what it is. Always be truthful in your thinking. Be the man that you say you are and be the same man that everyone sees you as. You got to have congruency. Number two, forge yourself in the way. Devote yourself to a path. Decide what rules you're going to follow and you hold to it. Number three, touch upon all the arts. You can learn martial arts through carpentry. I can learn how to be better at going through life by playing a video game because video game is just like life. I train for a long time. I build skills. I level up. It opens up new doors, new advances. I fight even bigger boss. I get even stronger. That's how life always goes and people shy away from it. There's truth to everything. And we may not realize it, but we find it. We watch movies and there's so much truth inside movies that we're hooked and addicted to it, right? Because someone else's story relates to us. There is continuity in everything. Learn to touch apart things. And one thing that Musashi was good at was not only was he a master swordsman, obviously, master poet. He was a master painter. I think he also did sculpting. He was also a botanist. He had all these other skills that he was a master in because he always felt that devotion to something and making rules for yourself and living that way was the best way to go through life. And you guys can learn a lot 
through everything else in your life. I think it was um one of my client, one of my uh guys inside my community group on school, shout out to the school group, um, told me about a karate kid movie, I guess with Jackie Chan. He said that uh, Jackie Chan, I didn't see that, I didn't see that episode, but he said that Jackie Chan told the kid at the time everything is kung fu. So not just doing kung fu, but it's also the way you talk, it's the way you communicate with people, it's the way you put on your clothing, it's the way you you know, go to school, it's everything has to be the same thing. When you guys understand life, you realize that your mentality for confidence and the way you hold yourself up should be the same in every single arena. That way, congruency is always who you are is who you say you are. And that's how you know it's real. Number five. I'm sorry, number, number four, know the ways of all occupations. Yes, yeah, study different ways and understandings of life, because in studying them and bringing understanding, you'll be able to open up areas to where you might become narrow minded if you only focus on one. Like if all I do is focus on the sword, I might lose my way. But if I focus, how do I get better at painting? Oh, maybe this long stroke, maybe this and that. You can break through barriers and make correlations. Human beings are amazing that way. There's so much truth in so many things. So don't lose that uh, that advantage of, uh, of curiosity. Number five, know the advantages and disadvantages of everything. Once again, learn pros and cons. One of my favorite things to do is to steal man arguments. I love it. I mean, I actually, I think I want to start a channel about steel manning. You know, like if you tell me, hey, I'm here's why you should vote for Democrats. Cool. Don't tell me that until you tell me why you should vote for Republicans. Because if you don't know the opposite side of the aisle, you don't know what you really think. You never do. Until you can tell me exactly an absolute steel man is in. Tell me truthfully, why is it good to vote for a certain candidate? Cool. When you tell me that, now I know you believe what you believe. But if you straw man it and you say, oh, don't do it because all those people are evil. I don't believe you then. I don't believe you. Because that's a lazy argument. It doesn't show me that you know all the advantages and disadvantages as to why someone might pursue something over what you think is correct. And that's all about being honest. That's all about seeing truth for what it is. You guys have to learn how to dispel this, you know, herd mindset that can often hijack your brain as a security blanket, which is what it does. It's like, cool. If I can just think one way about an entire group of people, I don't have to think about it at all. It's lazy. It's lazy. And you'll never be the best if you want to be lazy. Number six, develop a discerning eye in all manners. Same thing, right? Be able to look through things accurately. Understand what cannot be seen by the eye. Exactly. So you have to be mindful that there are going to be some things that you can't just prove, right? But you know they're there. Like, yeah, you can't prove that your mom doesn't tell you maybe that day that she loves you. It doesn't mean that she doesn't, right? So if you're the kind of person where you need to have daily reassurance and daily confirmation about things, then you're not really using your brain. You're not understanding that, Life is a lot more than just what you see with your eyes. It can be something greater. And through that greatness is where we pull our own strength. Um, number eight, pay attention to even small things, right? Success is in the details. Oftentimes, and there's an amazing documentary on, on Netflix came out years ago. Man, I might butcher the name of the restaurant. I think it was called 111 Madison or 11 Madison. It was the two years in a row top rated restaurant in the entire world. Guys, it's amazing. It's on Netflix. You should watch it. And they go over what makes it the number one restaurant. The guy who runs it, his attention to detail is like you've never seen before. He's looking at freaking light switches, wondering why things aren't even. Hey, you can scrape some dirt off of here right in the little, little screw hole and, and mesh this. He looks at every single detail in the world, which is why they have every single detail covered. So the more detail minded you can be, success is always in the details. Guys who are undetailed are often unsuccessful and vice versa. OK, so always pay attention to details. And last but not least. Do not involve yourself with the impractical. Don't do things that waste time, guys. OK, it's impractical consider, to consider realities that will never happen. It's impractical to spend your time playing video games and putting so many investments that are there. And then your bank account is still super low or you're negative or you're in debt. Doesn't make any sense. You guys should be focusing on things that are going to help to grow you. Throw away useless things. Throw away things that are inconsequential, impractical to you. Only keep practical stuff with you. Then you will be a strong man. Because think about it, the strongest man you know, that perfect guy in your brain, he doesn't carry around useless stuff. He doesn't have big wardrobes or clothes he never wears. He is very essential. He has very direct and deliberate things he likes to use on a daily basis that are going to make him a stronger man and ensure he's able to be productive and get his work done. Always contemplate that because that's exactly how you should be. Very, very practical. Okay. And he goes off to say, if you devote yourself to the way, you will defeat others with the strike of the hand or overcome others by the powers of your perception. If through your training, you can freely move your entire body at will, you will defeat others with this body. And by saying that, he's saying, if you have no physical restrictions, 
if you're strong, fast, agile, always on your feet, you're always ready for combat, which everyone should have a combat ready body. That's what I teach all my guys. You guys should always be in shape. I don't care what age you are. I'm almost 38 years old. I guarantee I'm in better shape than a lot of guys who are in their twenties. Why? Because I devote myself to it. I'm ready for anything at any given time. That's what it means to be a strong man because your body is a direct reflection of how your mind is and what you see in this world. You need to be a model of health and strength at all times. And if you can move your body freely, then you can defeat anyone with that body. So true. And if your mind becomes trained in the way, you will defeat others with your mind. Simple enough, man. There you go. So, guys, chapter one. That was the other chapter. I appreciate you guys joining me on this one. Uh, next week, we'll be doing chapter two, which is going to be the water chapter. We'll go over his explanation of his sword style. And I think the fire chapter, he'll actually go into actual topics of how to engage in battle and kick somebody's ass, right? So it's really amazing stuff. So um, you guys look forward to that one and we'll commune again next time. Until then, bam, take it easy.